Oh, <laughs> yeah, hit the button. I haven't done that in a while. Um, anyway, um, yeah, this neo-Nazi guy, uh, did make a video, sort of annoying. Um, I don't know what this picture is of, but it doesn't really matter. It's just a still image. Anyway, um, yeah, so he has a list of premises, which is sort of interesting. So I figure let's play the list of premises. Premises is a good way to argue with this premise thing. Uh, because then you can sort of find out where you're, you know, not agreeing and such. So anyway, let's play along, and hopefully you can hear this. If the universe, insofar as it relates to the human condition, is known to be material, then morality is material. Alright, uh, well this whole materiality thing, um, I don't know, does it really matter? Uh, you know, and to say morality, like, principles, ideas are material, I mean obviously they have to be made out of material. Our brain has to symbolize them in some way. You know, they have to have a representation in terms of a logical pattern. So you could say it's material in the sense that it's a, a pattern of a logical statement. You know, the earth is round. It's sort of a logical statement. Um, and morality is just a similar description of the circumstance. So, uh, you know, the value circumstance, you know, better to be eating cupcake than in concentration camp. Really not, um, you know, it's a logical statement describing a value circumstance. It's not really material, it's just factual. It's a relationship, the relationship between things, their differences what categories they fit in and what categories they don't fit in what properties they have what properties they don't have those things can be factually described but to say morality is material I think doesn't make much sense really mostly premise two if morality is material then any cogent moral code or social structure will be derived not from astral rubric but by a process of gene interaction with environment. Um, interaction with environment. Uh, yeah, you discover the truth by looking for it. You know, so sometimes you have to interact with the environment in some sort of deliberate way to discover truth. You're not going to discover it by accident. You have to often look for it to find it. Yeah, pretty much. And such. Next. Number three. If human genes evolved in the context of a small monoracial tribal unit with s small genetic distance, then the construction which we know as morality can be more purely derived from this context. Morality can be derived from the context of something to do with humans genetically evolving in a small group. <sighs> Sorry, I non sequitur. I don't. I don't see how you connect morality to evolution at all and um, that would be as stupid as saying you know whatever the biology says is right so somehow there's purity or logic or morality in an AIDS virus or something it's stupid it's doing stupid things to say stupid monkeys um, evolving uh, is somehow intrinsically or fundamentally sensible. No. I mean, there's nothing to base that on but some sort of God-bothering nonsense. Premise 4. All modern human morality is an adaption of this original biological lattice to a modern environment. No. I mean, yeah, for idiots. I mean, idiots say, yeah, it feels good, do it. That's what an idiot says. I want, I take. But obviously, the morality or values comes out of a, a more, obviously, a more complex understanding. I mean, you could you could say, okay, look, uh, you know, that year that the guy raped the virgin, you know, and threw her in the volcano, we all had a bumper crop of corn, so let's try that again. Let's, you know, rape and throw a virgin into a volcano. Well, it's just non-virgin after you figure raping her, but anyway, um... Yeah, and then you find out it doesn't work, and you say, wait a minute, that's really a dumb idea, because you're wasting a perfectly good, you know, hunk of stuff. So, um, yeah, just, I, 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 this, this, you know, the truth comes from 
our origins as a parasite is, I think, idiotic. Our moral truth comes from the our origins as a parasite? No. <laughs> Sorry, no sale. You don't throw virgins in volcanoes. It's stupid. And you don't do what feels good sometimes because it's not smart. It's not efficient. Premise 5. The human biology can only bend so much to the external environment. Human biology can only bend so much. And by so much you mean you can't stop me from hating on people <laughs> for no good reason. I can't stop myself. I can't control my impulses. I mean, that's idiotic. We do it all the frickin' time. There's women you want to bone, and you know, you, you can't just bone them on the bus, you know. You gotta ask permission, you buy flowers, and whisper sweet nothings, and do a whole bunch of other jibber-jabber before you get there. Those are the rules, do you understand? You figure out better rules to a game, and you play a better game. You don't just play massacre all the time. You play soccer or sometimes skiing or sometimes something. You just don't play massacre, massacre, massacre. No, you play different games when you're intelligent. I.e., <sighs> environment can never cause your genes to make you grow gills to breathe underwater. <clears throat> well, you don't need to breathe underwater to recognize that it's wrong to um, cheat somebody of uh, <clears throat> a fair fight. Uh, to uh, deny somebody, um, um, to, to, to treat people differently based on non-relevant differences, to blame the, an individual for the actions of a class, that kind of thing. It's wrong to do that. We can figure that out. It's not growing gills to recognize it and to act on it. This is really not growing gills behavior, wearing your seat belt, not drinking and driving. This is not growing gills kind of difficulty. And being fair to people just doesn't take that much effort. Premise 6. Research by Robert Putnam and other social scientists conclusively proves that racial diversity is a significant net drain on the social fabric of society. <clears throat> no, that's just a silly thing to put down as a premise. He absolutely proved it, because he said it. Oh, super. Um, look, you know, we, the, the, there's no point in arguing these statistics, but statistics can be perverted. We know that, you know, it's, it's like when people make judgments about cigarette smokers and they don't include the statistics that say, well, most cigarette smokers drink, well, most cigarette smokers eat crappy food. You know, they don't do any of this, the whole picture thing, and so then they draw a conclusion that's absolutely fucking wrong. So you want me to argue Mr. Putman or whoever the fuck it was and say, look, he's drawing conclusions based on circumstances that are unnatural, not natural in the first place, and that are skewed by the circumstances, skewed by the history. History fucks stuff up, okay? When stuff happens, stuff gets fucked up by that. And you can't call that a fair evaluation then, if it's fucked up. If you treat one beaker differently than you treat the other beaker, you can't say it's a controlled experiment, everything was the same. No, everything wasn't the same. Jesus. Premise 7. Race is a non-arbitrary, non-superficial delineation insofar as it describes discrete genetic clusters with adaptions ranging from appearance to musculature to psychological profile. Um, yeah, like, you know, you want to psychologically profile, you want to profile based on intelligence, say there's generalities, and, you know, we're back to this, how shiny is your butt, how much hair grows in your eyes, <laughs> you know, how much mold is in your brain. Um, <clears throat> yeah, you know, it's there to be picked at, okay? We, we can, we, we, you know, it's, it's existed, the, and, and yes, diversity is not fun. In the sense that, it, you know, for some people it's interesting, it's this and it's that, but obviously it can create an awful lot of conflict between people. But you're just scapegoating. You're, you're just saying, okay, I'm going to say the difficulties that are, in, are intrinsic in the social dynamic, I'm going to blame on this race issue instead of blaming on what you really need to blame it on, which is our competitive nature and the nature of hierarchy. Do you think in your all-white, purebred society you're still not going to sit there and pull out your measuring sticks and figure out who's got the biggest dick all over again? 
you know, by a different standard, who's got the shiniest hair, who's got the prettiest eyes, who's got the, you know, you're still going to play the same stupid idiotic game, and you're still going to scapegoat. Shit. Premise 8. Alternate delineations of gene sets, such as blue eyes or blonde hair, increase in arbitrariness as they decrease in size of genetic cluster. Who cares? <laughs> Again, th this fanaticism in it's establishing significance of difference when the significance can't be beyond even margins of error in this in these circumstances in many cases. So again, this this distinction that just somehow we're not going to be able to figure out that the Earth was round unless we had white people to do it is just idiotic. All right, uh, it just is. This not. While environmental social stigma can create intra-racial social unrest, it is either arbitrary insofar as it has been shown to be a purely social product, or it is arbitrary insofar as it refers to inconsequential and rare genetic stigma to certain traits. Genetic stigma to certain traits. I mean, that, you know, you want to sit there and say you're genetically gay, okay? I mean, these kind of arguments are just, in my opinion, sort of bogus. All right, there are people, there are, um, maybe there are a tiny percentage of you bigots who have some sort of, just, or just have a nasty little nitpicky hate gene or something. Um, but most of uh, most of you, you know where you came from. You came from a stupid environment that preached ignorance, and you learned how to be ignorant. That's all it is. So it's a conditioned response that you have to race because of some personal experience, and um, you know either either story, either the bad stories you were told, the little you know boogeyman stories about the nasty little darkies that are out there hiding behind the trees, ready to steal your money. Or you had some kind of personal interaction in the ghetto or something, um, and just feel totally um, resentful. And uh, again, you're going to blame the whole class um, on for that behavior, which is just bogus and bullshit. And you know it. Um, white. There's 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 trashy people. The fact that more trash comes out of poverty. It's just a fact. The fact that more blacks are raised in poverty is just a fact. You don't want to deal with those facts. Uh, you don't want to recognize those facts. Yeah, I can't help you. Premise 11. Because there are those who are willing to deal with the social consequences of multiracialism, they should be allowed to do so. Premise 12. Because... <clears throat> deal with the problem by what? Creating a non-society. You want to live in some sort of balkanized, smaller worlds where, okay, only the people with, you know, people with unibrows versus the non-unibrows will all create borders, and borders just create conflict, and conflict just creates death. So, it's just so defeating. You either believe in civilization or you don't. You have to make certain concessions to civilization. I mean, we don't have to be slaves to it. We don't have to be worker ants and, you know, privileged little, uh, you know, princess and prince ants and all this kind of crap. We can have a more fair and a more rational way to um, allow people to demonstrate their character and to be judged based on their individual character. So you're just antisocial, all right? You are in the end. Apparently, the only thing you can get along with is your own mother, and I bet you can't even do that. I bet you can't. <laughs> yeah, I bet you can't. There are those who are unwilling to deal with the social consequences of multiracialism. They should be allowed to do so. Premise 13. I thought you already said that. Uh, do so how? Again, by just breaking civilization. Turning us into, um, you know, a, a bunch of clans that'll constantly be stepping on each other's toes and fighting with each other. And you call that um, getting the most out of our humanness, and I'd say that's getting the least out of it. The very least optimal society insofar as it relates to each person's tolerance for suboptimal social variables should not be undermined for the very goal of optimal social values. And again, you, so your solution is nothing. Again, the, obviously we know there's social problems, okay? Poverty and ignorance. Poverty and ignorance. Dickens, you know, inside the king's robe, okay? <laughs> ignorance and want, okay? These things will ruin you. Ignorance and want. Ignorance and want. Um, 
and yeah that's what the, the poverty is just full of it so let's get rid of poverty let's get rid of the idea of birthing people into shit and then maybe you won't have an argument anymore but you don't have a solution to the problem besides let the babies die so until you do better than let the babies die yeah I'm not playing your game as this is a tautology premise 14 antinatalism is predicated upon a heap of untenable logical leaps premise <laughs> yeah untenable logical leaps as this is a premise right an inarticulated generic uh-uh and dynalism is uh-uh because it's wrong and it's because it's not right and because it's stupid and because it's not right and it's ignorant and it's stupid and it's not right. It's not a premise, jackass. You have to actually say something for it to be a premise. You have to make a contention that has some place I can demonstrate it to be right or wrong based on. You're not saying anything there. Uh, my yeah, my counter-argument is uh-uh. <laughs> Shithead. 15. There is no process by which to derive the value of sentience in the religion. There's no process by which to derive the value of sentience. Of course there is. Your own consciousness. It's the experiment right in front of your face. It's demonstrated right to you. The evidence wiggles inside of your little brain every single day. So you have this huge advantage of having evidence of it every day. Every day you have sensations, and every day you understand that, man, these are really powerful things. Um, so to, to deny the evidence of your own consciousness, why? Why would you do that? Why would you deny the evidence of your own conscious experience? It's just idiotic. It doesn't make any sense at all. I don't know. I don't know how you can get a more explicit claim than oh, you're feeling it right now, jackass. You're telling me it doesn't matter what you feel. If you feel absolutely horrible or you feel absolutely wonderful, those two experiences are the same. You can't make a value differential. You can't make a statement saying, yes, I think there's a significant value difference. Idiotic reliable way without referring to your emotions. You don't have to refer to your emotions like in defer, but certainly you can refer to the fact that you have feelings. You have done the experiment <laughs> extensively. You've done the experiment and you've seen it on the interior screen. I mean, I, you can't take the feeling screen and put it outside here like an iPod or something and say, see, that's what a feeling looks like. See, see how it is? That's a feeling. I can't pull it out of a brain and say, look, this is what a feeling is. All right? But, we, but you've had it, okay? You've seen the private screening. You had the private screening. You've seen the damn movie. You can't claim you didn't see the movie. It's stupid to claim you didn't see it. Or to claim seeing it has now prejudiced you. It hasn't prejudiced you. It's informed you. You now know what sentience is. Gee, <laughs> why is this complicated? Premise 16. There is no process by which to denote the moral value of suffering versus... Moral value is bullshit, but the value in terms of the differential value between suffering and not suffering is obvious, but go ahead. Pleasure. And suffering and pleasure. There. So he's saying to me, there's no way to know this. There's no way to demonstrate this. And what I'm saying is, is any sentient organism doesn't need a logical equation explaining it. Any in conscious in individual doesn't need me to place it on the table somewhere and show it to you in a petri dish. Here's consciousness, and here's suffering, and here's pleasure. You have the experience. If you're going to tell me honestly, without any bullshit, that you don't care whether you're in horrible, nauseating pain, or whether you're beautifully, wonderfully comfortable, if you don't care which state you're in, you don't see any difference, it doesn't make a dime's whether you wouldn't mind flipping a coin, if you can tell me that, honestly, all right, then you got an argument. But there's no way you can tell me that honestly. So this is, an, this is, is not an argument. Again, the fact that I can't show you what my personal experience has revealed to me doesn't change the fact that you have the personal experience shit had I shouldn't have to show it to you you're experiencing it Retard. astral sense premise 17 
there is no process by which to measure the aggregate zero-sum nature of suffering versus pleasure. Zero-sum nature um, doesn't have anything to do with pleasure. It has to do with the fact that pleasure is a derivative of the absence of suffering is the zero-sum argument. So the argument is is that you're placed in a negative condition and the derivement of gratification and comfort is merely the byproduct of relieving the built-in pressures. The gravity has compressed the spring. Um, and even when you're not aware of the compression, it's around you all the time, like air pressure. It's always there. And when it's relieved, released, you will have this sensation of ecstasy and enjoyment because you are relieved of burdens of poverty or worry or concern or emotional tensions and aggravations that exist in you all the time and when those are released by you know opening the mail and re seeing that you've won the lottery or something um, it will put a smile on your face. Premise 18. Some forms of pleasure seeking which result in high amounts of pleasure are clearly a violation of any reasonable materialist interpretation of morality. A violation of any materialistic... Why? I, I don't understand. If you have pleasure, it's a violation of morality. No, sorry. No, it doesn't make any sense. Premise 19. Moreover, it is not actually possible to create a legitimate objective theory that structures pleasure and suffering in a manner where they are objectively related to each other. Uh, I, I think it's just, I think it's, it certainly is. So you can say, I don't, I, again, how do you establish this as a, a, a premise based on what facts? I'm saying every natural fact, every fact you can observe in the psychology of the sentient organism demonstrates this compression mechanism I'm speaking of, this idea that the need or the hunger has to be built up um, and uh, that that's the deriving of the gratification and the satisfaction is through the building up of a hunger or attention or desire, a dissidence, uh, a conflict, um, and certainly that relationship between um, you know the whip and the carrot, the fact that it, it becomes a carrot to be relieved of the whip. If the whip is an everyday event and somebody takes away the whip as a bargain, as a reward, that's essentially a carrot. Not being whipped is a carrot. And that that phenomenon can be um, expounded upon a, as a uh, description of uh, the nature of mammalian psychology anyway, um, without certainly breaking the rules of reasonableness. So again, uh, your premise is not a premise. Premise 20. Both pleasure and suffering are unrelated biological adaptions that happen to optimize the potential of the species. Oh, whatever. The fact that it's it, they exist because it had a beneficial effect on survivability of a G DNA molecule is, is a fact. But that has to do with our violent nature and a lot of different parts of our nature. So the nature of the mechanism is to make us need, make us want, make us hungry, and make us aggressive, to live very aggressively. Um, that's our nature, because that's going to be rewarded over time in a very um, highly competitive environment. Um, kill first and you'll win. Kind of, it's just a truth of the reality. Often it, uh, first strike <laughs> is the, is the, 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 going to be rewarded in the long term. There's lots of elements of our psychology that are intrinsically and fundamentally unfair because the the game isn't uh, the natural game isn't intended to, it isn't constructed to be fair. It's constructed to make good um, uh, parasites um, and humans can expire to be much more than that I would hope. So I'm going to end here with a quote by um, Dr. Benjamin Garrison. I really think it says Doctor. pretty much everything. You know, I really think it says it all. I'm sorry. Okay, so here goes. So, the Jew is immunized against all dangers. Oh, whatever. He's going to do the Jew thing. <laughs> He's just such a silly, 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 silly fuckhead. Anyway, um, so yeah, most of your premises are absolute shit. I guess all, I mean, you know, I mean, none of them were... Even even if you were getting on to something that was almost realistic and relevant to something that could be accurate, um, you overworded it or overstated it 
and therefore ruined any grain of truth you might have fallen upon. So anyway, uh, till next time, the Inmendum Neo-Nazi Challenge. <laughs> I really don't, don't really care for that title much. I don't like you know, my name in that, but whatever. You know, I don't know if these idiots are any worse than the other phantasmagorical unicorn-chasing idiots either. The ones blowing the unicorn ass. Or sucking on it, whatever they're doing. Anyway, um, so, you know, just a run-of-the-mill general response video. <laughs> and there really is little to respond to if this is what I have to resort to, right? I got that kind of I have to respond to neo-Nazi videos. <sighs> People with a Junig complex. <laughs> yeah. Stupid fuckers. Junigmech. Next. Junigmech. Junigmech. Well, whatever. It doesn't matter.